have a new new people and new needs. We still need to have collaborative sessions just to actually reorganize the unit and see how we work with it. So the first the first um, <clears throat> the first assignment is about actually creating a what I call and it's very confusing because in every in every field people call the learning resource something else. But by learning resource, um, the way I actually thought about it when I was setting up the assignment was to create a, a thing that will be amazing for students to use to support their learning. Yeah. And since we can, and since, um, and it doesn't have to be, well, you have to create it <laughs> using technology because that's the only way I can actually see it. Mm -hmm. but it, it probably, in, a, in the way I'll be showing it, it probably would be a good idea that it actually has both uh, technology-based activities and also non-technology-based activities. But I like technology and I'll explain it one day why, but there's a lot of things that technology can't do and, and a person cannot actually do themselves. <clears throat> because <clears throat> because we have our own operational histories in a particular language. So when we move into another language, we actually don't have second language systems. So we're very much stuck in our own and we use this. And in order to actually use it as a support as opposed to an obstacle, certain exercises and certain things to be put in place are necessary and technology en enables this um, functionality quite well. So, uh, in, in relation to assignment one, would you have any questions? Or did you actually have a um, look? I've got, got it in front of me now. I did look at it last week, but I pulled it up so that I could look at it while we were talking. Um, yes. The only thing that I'm confused about is that the resource should be written in PowerPoint. So, I wasn't sure whether that meant that the activities, the resources and everything had to be in, embedded in PowerPoint because I was actually thinking doesn't. about doing a wiki. <clears throat> okay, it can be a wiki. I, mean, it, it, it's, I just suggested PowerPoint to just move people away from Word. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can be done in any form. Okay. And wiki, wiki or Google Sites or any other structure, it's good. PowerPoint is portable because if you actually upload it on, if you actually, you can upload it on AuthorStream and AuthorStream allows to ex allows things to be presentable. It's, it's a little bit better than SlideShare. So you can still actually upload it online, the uh, PowerPoint when you actually do, do so. When you upload it on AuthorStream, then mm -hmm. you, it can be actually visible online. But I don't mind. Actually, some people do it online do it using uh, Google Sites or Wiki or any sort of thing. So that's the presentation of it. Okay. Well, I'd probably do a PowerPoint for the presentation for the context and things like that. And then one, the, the resource that I'm thinking, or the support mechanism that I'm looking at creating is a Wiki, um, which will have various exercises and links to things and like actually as a, that that itself would be the, the resource. Mm. Does that sound reasonable? Yes, yeah, it's, it's very good. It's very good. I'm not. I'm, I, I think it sounds very good. But I, I, but in principle, I just give as much flexibility as possible because really, uh, draw a pencil. I'm just trying to share something online. I might just put it. Maybe what I will do, I'll just share uh, the screen, and that will allow everyone to say everything that I say. I've lost where I am. Where am I? Yes, I'm seeing your screen now. Yeah. So basically, um, it's a, it's a, creating a resource will be worth for this semester will be worth forty credit uh, forty percent. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do is um, so in the context of your choice, but it has to be a school context of so because we need to have a curriculum. So the resource yeah. should be written black. So description of the teaching and learning context. So that's basically just just um, you know year seven or year five or year four mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Just the justification of the pedagogic approach. You will find some readings online regarding this. 
Mm-hmm. But I f- and you also will find a lot in those YouTube recordings and those PowerPoints I um, I have shared mm-hmm. yesterday. I will show you some of the concerns that I have regarding pedagogy, and that might actually be helpful. I just have to. Open I haven't time. actually been able to find the PowerPoints. I've got the YouTube, like I've got the um, the YouTube session. But I've only got, um, I don't actually, hang on, there's, a, there's one PowerPoint too. So there's the Lope 01 and there's Sam. The way, to, yeah, the way to find it, you will have to go to the discussion board because mm-hmm. I couldn't upload the PowerPoints on the email. Okay. I, so they are all in the, so when you actually go to add the oh, I've just got board, it, I've got it. Yeah, go so there's okay. one, two, three PowerPoints. Yeah. So yep. so so they so they have things in it. Mm-hmm. So I might just actually take you through through something some some ideas here. So when we look at this thing that I've done the other day, it might be important. Some of the some of the some of the things that I am we are I mean this is a little bit you know like a, a bit advanced. The concerns that actually come from uh, the, the fields that, that I actually draw on, which is semiotics, neuroscience, um, phonetics, corrective phonetics, and so on. Basically, typically, people think in education that we have a brain where we have one neuron equivalence with one object. So when you see a table, you have a table in your head. There's nothing like that. Um, so you don't see your husband ever, you don't see your child ever, you don't see anything ever. There, you make pretty good, well-working guesses on the basis of a number of systems that interact together for as long as you actually need it. So I was showing this yesterday somewhere and I was showing this um, on the weekend. We had a workshop here um, and what it, um, I might just make it smaller. So what it says, for example, if you look at the vision, the vision consists of perception of different things, and mm-hmm. they, they are integrated with other systems, and they give you, a, so when you, so um, one of the things when you work on, in school, you will notice that children have disabilities, but these disabilities are not something that they have and we don't have. It's just that we ha- manage to have associations or integrate systems so well that, that the complexity of processing of information is not visible, and yet it is so visible that when children cannot actually coordinate lines with some other aspect of contrast and luminosity and all of this, they and they or there are breakages with their other processing systems which have to do with listening or with information organization, then uh, problems appear big problems appear. But what, what actually neuroscience is saying, and we knew it in semiotics, and we knew, which is a field uh, concerning itself with meaning making, and also we knew it um, in language teaching for quite a while, although it's not in the mainstream of TESOL, that we are not only multisensory, but what it means is that, that we are multisensory, which means that there are different senses. Each sense is, inter, uh, is, is talking to other senses through relationships that make sense to a particular person. So information is not kept in one neuron, it's kept across the brain, right? So when we, when we actually talk to each other, when we, whether it's in first language or in second language, we actually trigger a number of associations in the brain throughout the brain in order for the brain to process. And it's mm-hmm. very important. And it's very important for loud teaching because if we think that we will present to children a flashcard which is typically done in literacy or a, a thing and we say, you know, um, this is the house or this is a lamp or this is blah. And we as teachers think, well, now you have to memorize it and you will have it, you know. Well, no, this is actually a quite unfriendly way of teaching. I don't know how you learn German, but that's how I learn German. But although I had actually a German teacher who was well, that's how I was taught German. It doesn't mean I learned German this way, but that's how I was taught at some stage. So basically, vocabulary lists and memorization sort of, it, they, they actually work. People say it does work, and I agree. It does work for the period of the semester or for, or for the exam, 
but it doesn't stay because the because because the information because the, the, the form of teaching is information poor, and if it is information poor, it's kept in 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 the processing memory, but it's not kept in, like in RAM, like in the computer. It's kept in yeah. RAM, but it's not actually inside on the hard drive. In order mm -hmm. to be in the hard drive, it has to be integrated across systems. And that's why sometimes viruses work so well, because they attack one system, and that system is contact to other systems, so consequently the whole machine breaks down. This so actually fits in. We're doing, um, I work at a selective school, and we're doing a lot of GAPS training. Um, so a lot of what you're saying actually relates to what we've been talking about at school, and one of the big challenges is that the load department are actually quite resistant because they don't understand how to apply kind of conceptual chunking in languages. So it's very interesting what you're saying. The board, the, 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 the teachers, whatever it is called board, uh, curriculum board or whatever they call it, New South Wales, was the most hard-headed, uh, difficult, lot of people. My husband, uh, or my ex-husband right now, Professor Ed Ryan, was uh, actually, we were living in dance, we used to live in Brisbane, because he was a professor, he, he would go to these to this curriculum boards or whatever they called them in New South Wales. And literally, they were so hard-headed that it, it just, and every time he would open his map, they would say, but Andrew, <laughs> but Andrew, <laughs> mm. <laughs> but, you know, it is difficult. You wouldn't understand. It is uh, he wouldn't understand. Of course, he's been a professor all his life, but he wouldn't understand. So anyway, <laughs> so I, can understand your, I can understand your challenge, and it, it's, it's probably a never-ending battle. Another thing that I might, so basically, just to cut the long story short, processing is complex. If we want students to actually make meaning, what we need to do is provide them with opportunities to to, to Look at the thing they learn in more than one way, so that mm -hmm. different sensory systems get uh, activated, and consequently the information is integrated with other systems, and therefore it's deeply encoded. Mm. If we want a monkey methodology, which is which which has been with us for quite a while, we we are happy when children when children replicate the behavior for us and we're happy, we say, oh no, it works, of course it works, because a person can repeat it, a person can memorize, but as I said, it is not language learning, it's a monkey method uh, and people forget it. I learned French at the University of Queensland using monkey method, I, did high, I, got high, I got high distinction and then when I had a French friend and I rang him and I wanted to say hello, how are you, I, I couldn't come up with any words because all I had is, you know, <laughs> Like you know, where are the gloves of Mireille? Mireille forgot gloves mm -hmm. in the taxi, and TV found the gloves. As, till today, I can say these texts, but I can't produce sentences. Well, I couldn't back then, but then my husband was teaching French, so I learned French from him and his mother-in-law. So, as they were talking at home, because in the house we had French. So, um, yes, so so. People have to have access, opportunity to look at things they learn in more than one way so that different sensory systems get evoked and, and, in, and activated so that actually they create rich networks, rich connections and rich associations in their brain. And this is something that we will be looking at, how can we actually facilitate it. And if we don't mm. achieve it very well this semester, we will, I can assure you, achieve it very well next semester because that's what we are focusing very much in the second semester. First semester is to play with the resource, how to create it, which is get, into, get kind of, you know, get a feel for it. But second semester, we're already into it. Mm -hmm. One other thing that I wanted to say, as you will notice that I gave a, that I gave a, I mean, I'm actually now taking leading leadership role in our state uh, of the, in, 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 in the area of play. Mm -hmm. And I just use play because actually it's not too bad to actually bring a lot of people together and, and that's how you lead, that's how you become a leader in, in, in any, prof well, in education at least. But one thing I wanted to say, and when you actually look at this, uh, at this picture of how we process, you will notice that when, when you, this is from art because I was looking at, the, well, that they were just talking an art object, it doesn't matter what it is, an object, a thing. Uh, whatever, the mm -hmm. perception. As soon as you see a thing, 
the first place where the information goes that you have noticed, it goes from the, say, retina or from your ear, it goes to the limbic system first. And it's very important because it's, a, it, it's actually assessed first by your emotions. Mm -hmm. And then and then it looks at other things and then goes back into emotions and looks back into other things and then back into the emotion. And what's most interesting, actually, that we never really hear what's here. This is what Damasio, Damasio is Antonio Damasio. He actually was even famous when I was an, a postgraduate student, I think, you know, in the 90s or 80s, I can't remember, a long time ago, when I, well, 90s probably, I can't remember. When I was studying, he was already famous. And what he's actually saying, that you never hear a thing, and you can understand that you never hear a thing, because if you did, or if I did hear English as it is, then I wouldn't have an accent, right? So there's a reason why I <laughs> actually have an accent. But what he's saying mm -hmm. is very interesting. The information goes, for example, the hearing. It goes into your ear, then it goes into your brain, the brain does things with it, then it sends information back into your ear, and you heard it. Oh. I know. Fantastic, isn't it? But what it does say, that the key, that nobody actually hears things. They process, and then they hear it. And oh. that's how accent happens. Oh. And that's how, exactly, that's how accent happens. And that's how, for example, misunderstanding happens between languages. And that's why people sometimes, you know, because in order to be actually processed, in order to be heard, it has to be processed yeah. first. So the brain goes through all the, act, activates all the interpretatory systems. And of course, uh, when we are studying a, a second language, most of those interpretatory systems are L1. And so they activate it, someone makes sense, and they say, that's what I heard. I heard blah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what was said was one thing, and what they actually heard was another thing, right? So now is what I'm saying. In order for a person to see it a little bit more, like a second language person, then they need to actually activate many systems so that they, they can actually create uh, different perspectives from which they actually look at the thing in order to actually see many angles of it and then go, oh my god, first time when I heard that it, it was not, nothing like that. Mm. So, that's, that's so, so this is still about this, but the reason why I talked about emotion, and I just want to summarize this thing is, I talk about play, but I actually have a $25,000 grant not to talk about play, but to talk about actually well-being and students' resilience. And, and what actually is happening is that when a person is in a situation of a classroom and when the teacher doesn't understand these few things that I have just mentioned regarding how perception works, the child is in a total stress, right? So what happens, the teacher says something, the child hears something else, the teacher doesn't understand why the child doesn't hear something that they just said, it doesn't understand why the child can't reproduce what the teacher requests. So what happens now, we have to find a halfway, so the halfway usually is the teacher gives them a textbook, tells them to memorize, the children memorize, and it's just an old game. But there is a stress factor happening in classroom because it's the teacher who formulates the meaning, formulates the problem of the classroom, even formulates what's called the topic of the activity. So today we do colors, tomorrow we do furniture in IKEA, next day we do it at the coffee shop, and the next day we do it in the shopping mall, in the sh shopping center, right? Most of the time these things are disconnected and the idea is that maybe hopefully somehow by some miracle of God or someone else, children will put the furniture together together with the coffee shop one day and they will be able to talk about the weather. <laughs> but that's a pretty much, that's, that's how a lot of these things are done. Somehow the children will put together different content and they will actually will be able to create something with it. But, well, it's very difficult. It is very, very difficult to do that. So what I'm saying is the reason why I will talk about play and playful activities, whatever, whether the students are 16 years old or 6 or 8 or 10, it's bec not because play is something like putting children into a sand pit. The, the, the ethical, the ethical, um, the ethical parameters of play 
are, but play enables children or the students to formulate the problem, right? And that's the only way they can actually be. They can't formulate, you can't formulate the problem on their behalf, nor can you find the solutions on their behalf. They actually have to do it themselves. Otherwise, a te the, the teacher hijacks the whole pedagogy and makes the child march to their steps and sooner or later we lose them and then we say nobody wants to study languages. So the mm. reason why we're looking, we're looking into it in order to actually have students in classroom, in order to have willing students in classroom <clears throat> and in order for everyone to have a good day. You probably will also, I mean you study German, but because of your load pedagogy, sooner or later, I'm sure, because that's what's happening in Northern Territory, because of the uh, Australian curriculum, sooner or later someone will probably request from you an expertise of, on load teaching, because actually load is being integrated with uh, five-year-olds and six-year-olds, you know, in, uh, in the curriculum, and they will need mm. some expertise in load. So even though at this very moment you might be teaching in, in a higher level and one day you might be teaching in the middle school, that expertise actually would be quite unnecessary if you are in school for younger children. So I just, I'm just saying this because um, so that you don't actually frame yourself, oh, I do this. You know, as they often mm -hmm. say, whatever you do today, you will not be doing in, in two years' time. Mm -hmm. And my life happened, my life actually worked out this way. So, I mean, I do, I do lots of things nowadays. So, um, so basically we have a particular few things that we have already about pedagogy we have established. So I'll just show you what we have established just in case you might have not noticed. So we will just go there uh, because sometimes it's not visible. So justification of a pedagogic approach. Typically when we talk about pedagogy we say, well, well how do you see a student? What's the role? What's the job of a student in your environment? And here we actually decided that the job of the student is actually to make sense, to make meaning, to make meaning, to, to actually, in, to actually in, engage in a meaningful way with the content. And it's just as simple as this. What's the job of a teacher? To make that possible, right? So it's, the job of the teacher is not to teach. The job of the teacher is to make it possible for students to engage meaningfully or to make sense out of uh, things they want to do in German. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a kind of, people typically call it facilitator and a lot of people in critical pedagogy have a problem with this word. I'm not arguing about words, I just want to argue about the distinction. So the distinction is we don't teach, we enable learning. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the only way you can follow, that's the only way you can follow. I think I've got this somewhere written as well. I don't know. So right, I've taken notes. I have it written, so I just put it up somewhere because it's visible. It went visible. Uh, yes, you can. So this is on this video you have. So unlike teaching, play is a space of learning. So very often people say students negotiate meaning, you know, they have all these phrases which they stole from different studies and from different important research uh, studies. But they stole those words, but they didn't mm -hmm. steal the meaning with it. So very often people talk about negotiation and learning is important, but then they go back into teaching and doing the old stuff that you put mm -hmm. in the 16th century. But in the 16th century, that made sense to, it made sense to teach this way because resources, uh, even a book, was the same cost as a house. You know, when, when someone got a book in the 16th century, it was like equivalent mm. of $200,000 a house today, right? And now we, we are in the 21st century, we've got other resources as well. We need to make use out of this because we're living, we, we just have it. We don't have to continuously run with worksheets and boring worksheets uh, and, and, and a textbook. There are other things to, and, and, and we have learned quite a lot what we can do with students in order to actually create a learning Like teachers are very attached to their textbooks. Oh. Yeah, I know. But that's, there are different reasons for it. I mean, I'm old enough to actually know. I mean, I've, I to actually know why this happens. What, and and 
and largely it is because of they were taught this way to do that. If you, if you haven't seen examples what else can be done, mm -hmm. you replicate. You replicate what you know. And if it works, I mean, if you're getting results from it. And you think you can control. Yeah. Well, they get results, as I said. They get the monkey method result, which is, you know, a child can repeat the text, but can they actually talk to a French person? Can they actually have a dialogue? Or can they actually, um, you know, I'll give you an example. I get Chinese scholars, okay, so I'm high enough in the hierarchy that I actually now and then see a Chinese scholar, I have to interact with them, I have to do things with them, okay. So I've got this person who studied all mm -hmm. his life China, uh, English in China. Yeah, well, it's actually getting better now, but in the past, it was like in the 90s, it was really bad. But now, Nowadays, it's getting better, but they still don't have access to YouTube, so things are still kind of bad. But anyway, so I get this person. And what does he do in English? He speaks with English words, but he might as well spoke, had spoken Chinese. I mean, the whole demeanor about him, everything is Chinese. The posture, the intonation, the choice of words is Chinese, and the way mm -hmm. he understands Australia is all China. Right? They don't understand how we run things in Australia, have no information about how the uh, governance works in China, in Australia, how things, how you make things happen in Australia. So they have no cultural understanding of how we mm. go about our days in Australia. So for example, I was running this project with a, a Chinese scholar and um, and I, back then I was into critical thinking, all right? So <laughs> never mind, it doesn't matter what channel one uses, it all works. So I taught her some critical thinking in English and then she applied it to understand because she, but back then there was this big story mm -hmm. about floods in Brisbane. That must have been some time ago. And when she applied, she created a little research project on floods in Brisbane in English using my prompts for critical thinking. She could not believe it. Oh my God, she found out why they had a problem, that communications don't work, but there are particular um, uh, systems put in place, but there's a bureaucracy and people haven't thought about some things and nobody was talking to anyone. And she was learning about actually what really culture mm -hmm. is. Culture is how we do things here, how to, how to make things happen. You come to Australia, you want to win. I mean, I've got students and they're English students. I forget about them being from Germany and not now. I've got Australian students who have no idea about grades and they're in year two at this university. I, I have a problem with one student. He said he got mm -hmm. past considered that was a high grade. He got a pass and thought it was a high grade. I, mean, I don't know how he's... No, no, no. He didn't get pass. He got pass considered. Yes, I do. You know what's pass considered? Mm -hmm. It's just about fail. It's fail, but I felt sorry for mm -hmm. a person, so I gave them PC. So anyway, so he thinks it's a high, high, high grade. Anyway, so so that's what I'm saying. Culture is not um, food or whatever. Culture is how you go about the, about getting things done in Australia, or, or or how do you go? At, how do you react to how things are done in Australia? That's culture. How do you react? So when Mr. Bean says in his sketch, you know, some of you who, are, who might be more perceptive would notice that this is hell <laughs> and I am the devil, but you can, but you can call me Toby. <laughs> and everybody in my, class, in my class laughs and I ask them, why are you laughing when he says his name is Toby? Right? And they don't know, they laugh, but they have no understanding why. So, you know, we spend time actually trying to dissect, break down the word Toby, what connotations does the word Toby brings about when someone says, and I say, someone you can trust, someone friendly? Well, mm -hmm. it's not quite the devil, is it? No. And that's why, that's why it was funny, because it breaks the expectation. But that's what I'm saying. Culture is about learning how to get things done in Australia and how to actually react to the things that are done in Australia. So the same in your lot situation. So it's quite complex. So if we can get students memorize text, and for you, a teacher might be, it works. But in, in fact, it's a monkey method. It, it works because the child replicates the behavior that you want. To, it's a compliance pedagogy. Yes, the child replicated it well or badly. It doesn't matter. They replicated it, kept it in their RAM memory, right? But really never learned anything. And most of all, 
most of all, it's not even whether it works. It's not even whether it complies with curriculum because it doesn't, and I'll show it throughout this semester, throughout this unit, it doesn't comply with. But most of all, what it does, it creates stress situation. Right? And that's what I had here, and then I had on this other slide for started this one here. It creates, we need to reduce stress. And the only way you can reduce stress is if you actually enable students to be present in the classroom, not always us. This is the text, this is the theme for the week, this is what we will be studying, these are the words, can we repeat it? Can you, I can memorize, I can make my cat <laughs> memorize any French or German text, let alone my students. I used to be so good at it until, some, until my husband basically made me actually see things another way. So my students were memorizing, but I bet that I just, you know, like when they went to Germany, they couldn't remember all the text at once, nor could they actually hold the conversation. So the idea is that we don't, so even if, if, if when they comply and things pop out from their math, we should not actually take it as a sign of them actually learning language. But even if we did, the biggest problem is that when we hijack the, 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 the process of learning, when we replace the process of learning with the process of teaching, what we do create is a situation of stress. And for the first week it might work, maybe for the second week, but sooner or later children get very tired of studying those characters, remembering words, and there is no fun because we want them to memorize. We don't want them to actually create. We just want them to produce. Well, creation is actually production, yes, but it's not the same, Anya. We don't want them to produce things. Why would we want them to do something like create a game in German or create a beautiful um, story for people in the HK Center where they have actually also German um, citizens, right? Because when people grow older, they remember their first language better than, than the second language. So it'd be nice to do something, you know? So it'd be nice to engage with an HK Center where they have German residents and maybe bring in a German community at the same time and so on. So we could create something, a story for them. Oh, I know they can't create the story. We are on, on present tense at the moment. Now, I want to see a baby who is learning English when they are one day old and two days old, but they start first with <laughs> present tense and they learn past tense well. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? This is such nonsense that we carry this stuff with us, and because it is done so frequently and for so many years, but I we think that's why it. it's different if you we'll learn a language in an immersion situation because you learn it organically. You don't learn it by memorizing things out of a book. Like there's no sequence in terms of the way you exactly. learn a verb. You learn to use it in the context. So try to have a sequence, and you will never, then you will never ever ever. So get would you say done. it's more about if you ask students to create meaning, giving them the tools they need to express what they want to express, rather than giving them a framework and then saying, well, yes. you need to express this with those words. So starting with the meaning. Exactly. That's the first one. Yeah. Because that's what they have. The other one is our image. The other one is the culture of teaching, right? We've been, this is what, you know, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. But the one you said first is the way how actually aristocracy was learning French, aristocracy was learning German, aristocracy was learning languages, right? That nobody was doing things, whatever. They were actually mm. traveling. They had French babysitters, right? They, they were actually living in it. One of the papers, early papers when I was a PhD student I wrote was living in a, living in a language or living in, la in a language, right? It's, uh, some work, someone published that stuff. I don't know how good it was, but that's what it was about. It's living in a language. It wasn't about sequencing. And, and I don't know now how, how your experiences in learning German were, but I'll give you my experience and consequences of it. So I learned French at university, I couldn't speak it, I, didn't, I just memorized the text. It's, it's a very forgettable experience, right? So we moved on and then I married a guy who was French and his mother was living with us and my dog spoke French because we taught him French. Now the way I learned French is going to be very funny. I had a few words in French because I learned it at, at university, that's true. And I also spoke several languages by the time I learned French. So I, my, my husband was very, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a gentleman. So when my mother-in-law lived in our house for 10 years, every day or every so many days, he would have a session with his mother 
to update her on the running of the house. So the things we do, the things we've done, the things that will happen, right? And I used to sit on the stairs and listen to this <laughs> conversation. Every some regularly. That's how I learned. They didn't learn them from them talking or anything, because in front of me they would speak English. But I learned, but I was listening, listening, listening to these conversations. And after a while, it was unbelievable. My listening French was amazing because what was good, I actually knew that they were talking about the running of my of the household, and I knew what was happening in the household. So I was, I already had some 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 tools for understanding because I was part of the household. So I already, so I could actually make up what they were saying. But one thing I have to say that from all of this that I, that was most amazing. When I started to see with, when I, but because he was a professor, we would see all these ambas, ambassadors and all of that. And someone had a wife who was Australian, right? So he was French. He spoke French really fast, as the French do. But his wife was Australian, and when she spoke French, she spoke with a very, very heavy Australian accent. And it was so embarrassing because when her husband produced beautiful French really fast, I got it. I was there sitting and having fun. When she spoke, I understood no. nothing. Not a freaking word. That was so embarrassing. And it was so visible that her accent was actually disturbing. And then another thing happened. When my husband was showing uh, some videos, he, we were teaching pedagogy of load, right? And he was showing some videos made for teaching French. And you, you know how our students obviously are retarded. <laughs> and we have to see. <laughs> And we have to pro produce this very slow French or very slow German so that they can hear it. Well, actually, it doesn't work like this. But you know what was happening to me? Because I learned French as it was, not as it was on the video for children or for people who just, you know. I couldn't remember. When the sentence finished, I couldn't remember what was in the beginning of that sentence. It was so slow, and, and my rhythm mm. was French. I actually was, I actually acted French, was French. My, my rhythm was French. And I don't have this, maybe I have it here, but this is what my, where did he do that? I don't know. I've got so many assignments open because my students were pretty, anyway, I don't have this thing open. But my ex-husband was here, of course, because we still work together. We didn't, you know. Anyway, so he came here, and he was talking about rhythm. And he was talking about intonation, but also rhythm. And I will show you some stuff. Basically, we are all rhythm. Neuroscience are saying everything is rhythm. Everything is connected. Our brain functions in ways we are rhythm. So rather than actually teaching them the way how Germans speak in the German rhythm, we slow down things so much that then when I actually learned a foreign language in a normal context, when I was listening to this to these teachery videos, I couldn't mm -hmm. process it because it was not natural. I couldn't remember at the end of a sentence what they said at the beginning of a sentence because my brain was organized in a French way, not in a mm. pedagogic way. So if we want students, if we want to have students to hear or to understand listening comprehension, to do, to do the listening comprehension, to understand spoken text, we might think of different ways of helping them, not by changing the text, but by giving them many ways of accessing mm. the text. That's different. We can actually do listening comprehension exercises of, of the text, not of some pedagogically invented text. And as Mark Twain said, nobody spoke intermediate French in France. Mm. You get it? Yes. So we produce these we produce these pedagogic texts that nobody actually uses or speaks in France. They actually speak French. Mm. So. We, put, we give these artificial sentences, we remove culture because we teach them the words, hoping that somehow these words will bring culture with them. But what they do, they bring the Australian culture with them, not the German culture mm. with it. Um, so then we read the French as arrogant, the German as dry, the these ones as this, because we actually don't um, integrate it. The, 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 don't bring all the systems together. So basically, the point of today, if we were to talk about the assignment, and if we were to talk about justification of the pedagogic approach today, 
for today at least. What, what I would like to summarize today our class, our meeting today, is that what we want to do, what we, want to, what we need to do is understand that processing and perceptions are not simple things. Mm. If they were simple, people wouldn't have accents. Right, we wouldn't have different differences in, social, in, in backgrounds. We wouldn't have people with diff have have different accents, and right, we would be all the same. We would be like computer rep computer based replicas of each other. But it doesn't work like this. So I showed that actually perception is quite complex. So that we use our first language resources to understand foreign language. That's great because that's what we have. But if we actually present information to students one way, then they rely on L1 too much. What we need to do for them is to actually find ways that they can access text or actually access perception of whatever the object is that they study using different senses, using different processing systems so that they can actually look at it from many angles and in that way develop a complex perception of whatever they study, not just a one-to-one -one, and therefore really relying on L1 and therefore getting really, really overloaded and tired. And what I wanted to say also, I use the context of play as a, as a ethical context which, because it allows me to say Play is an environment where, which is set up to facilitate learning. Play is not about teaching. And when we actually facilitate learning what we do, we enable children to be present in the classroom, have fun, enjoy what they do, as you said, make meaning, as opposed to be told to repeat. And consequently, children not only just have fun, but they actually feel well. Mm. And they want to be in your class. They want to be in your class. And that's very important because especially in the Northern Territory, it's very important. It's everywhere important. But in the Northern Territory, what you have is a situation where Aboriginal children tend to walk out from the classroom, right? Because they have their own educational system. They don't actually have to stay in the classroom. So if you actually are ever asked to support, to provide some pedagogical support for children who are five-year-old or six-year-old, by having these complex understandings, what you do, you actually, you actually think, will think of ways of how to increase fun and therefore well-being so that Aboriginal children or Vietnamese children want to stay in the classroom as opposed to walk out. Vietnamese child will stay in the classroom because their parents will make it stay, but an Aboriginal child will walk out. And then we have a problem. Aboriginal children have a low, um, will, will have, have high rates of absence from schools, mm -hmm. but we bore them. We bore them to tears, and our kids have no choice, they stay, they walk out. So well-being is very important. Well-being comes with, um, in, uh, well-being actually will happen when children are actually enabled to, are given tools to actually make meaning. Well-being will not happen when they are basically taught and uh, made absent in the, feel absent in the class and basically regulated by the teacher with no way of expressing. We will be, talk we will be also in integrating culture in those um, in activities because we want children to actually um, learn language as it is, which means uh, as it is used, so we want them to actually learn about how, how things work in Germany or how things work in Indonesia or how, and also how to respond to the things as they are in Indonesia. So that when someone does one thing or another, our students actually get a pretty good idea of how to respond. Mm -hmm. So that they do, not act, they do not act English in an L2, because sometimes it may not matter, but sometimes it does. I'm, um, I'm fascinated, but my head keeps going to, that's awesome. How do I, what does that look like in the classroom? Yes. Yeah, well, what we'll strategies can I use? What you know? I'm very, I'm excited. Okay. Like that so, all sounds great to yeah. me, but yeah, I'm excited. So we will. We, yeah. So what I suggest, you look through some different PowerPoints and through different YouTube's YouTube recordings, and ha start creating some sort of understandings, and we take it from there. In uh, not next week because I'm in America, mm -hmm. but a week after. Yeah, um, I'm not sure not where the that. others. We will be fine. I'm not yeah, sure where fine. the others are. Um, yeah, typically it, it, it's a normal situation on um, at, at, at uh, on LearnLine. 
well, today it's Friday, so I can understand that people couldn't make it. That's another thing. It's a very weird time. But we had to have it this week, this session, because I, I, I almost had a heart attack when I realized that I mixed up two units. But uh, anyway, I had to do Thursday night. That's, I just yeah, okay. Well, that's good. Uh, we can do it Tuesdays. Tuesdays is perfect we can do it for me. Yeah. Yes. Tuesdays is perfect, but I think that in two weeks we still do Friday mm -hmm. because Tuesday I will be still traveling, but I will okay. be here on Friday, and I, and I don't want to lose that week. Yeah, of course. So Friday so we in do two it, weeks. Yes, we do it Friday in two weeks, and then we may negotiate with other students whether they want Tuesday. So we do yeah. it on the discussion board with Tuesday. I usually hold these sessions late because some of our students are teachers or mm -hmm. assistant teachers or whatever, but I'm happy to any time. I, I mean, I have semester two, I have very little teaching because I use it for research, so I ha I'm fully uh, flexible for any time and any week or any mm -hmm. weekday. Well, I mean, daytimes don't work for me because I'm at school, because I'm teaching. Exactly. So, so that's, um, it. that's done. So already you yeah. are the case, right? You are one of those people. But that, that's why I, I, I hold these classes late, because that's the only time when yeah. we can actually have it and accommodate for teachers. All right, yeah. so we meet in, on Friday in two weeks. Explore a little bit of the stuff that I've sent around. Get some ideas, and I will focus it better next week. I just cannot run the entire unit. I know, because it feels like reading the book. You don't want to put the book away. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I know, but I do need to sleep today. So. Yes, of course you do. <laughs> um, no, it's fabulous, so, and so I'll, um, I'll uh, do some reading and exploration before the next session. Yeah. The reading is not as much, I mean, I put some stuff there uh, because I have to and so on, but I actually want us to, uh, I don't know what I put up there, I just there's some stuff there. Like the book by Kumarava Develo, it's lots of discussion, lots of talk, but I don't think that he comes up with any solutions. Um, no, well, that's from what I've read of his, I'm just like, okay, I agree with you, but what do we do now? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly the thing. That's why I don't actually even, I mean, I, I teach core unit of, uh, pre core unit in teaching teachers how to teach literacy for little children. It's, mm. it's like you, it's, it's politically the core unit of the whole freaking Australia, right? It's like the yeah. it. And I don't use any textbook. Yeah. And you, you can ask me how I got away with it. I did. I don't forbid. Oh, look. I don't forbid them. students. Right, they old, written by old people long time ago. They are sitting on the 13th edition of that book, which might have been written in the 90s or 80s, by yeah. people who, you know, whatever. I mean, there's no way. There's no way I'm going to rely on someone's textbook. They can read and we can, you know, they can look at things. But I think that it, my role here is to bring it all together, as opposed to just follow someone. Because you might as well just read the textbook on your own, right? What do you need me exactly. for? Exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm so, excited. Okay, so, yeah, me too. I love this stuff. So, okay, so we will, so you just have a look at things, especially the videos and so on, and, and get your own imagination running at the same time, and then we will bring it a little bit more focused next week, and we will start actually sure. design, design the activity together, and we might actually put up some things online. I might give you a plan, but I'm not sure where I will. I'll give you some things. I'll give you some things. Yes. Okay. Um, all right? Fabulous. Have a lovely okay. weekend. It was you nice too. to meet Thank you. you very, yeah, same here. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Just have to now turn it off somehow. <laughs> Hang on.